Uh, thank you. Uh, well, hi, everyone. It's a bit uh, weird to, to speak to a room full of people and not be able to see any of the room, but um, I'm really happy to be here and to have this session today because, um, well, it is a, quite an important topic. Hopefully, uh, you'll all be convinced of that at the end of this session. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'll uh, first discuss uh, why we need to think about sustainability when running training sessions, uh, but also then focusing on computational biology, um, where are the greenhouse gas emissions coming from and how can we estimate uh, the carbon footprint of what we're doing? So there has been quite a bit of interest in that, especially in the past year or so. So I, I'm just skimming through fairly quickly. Uh, it's mostly been about the impact of travel. Um, so for example, the, um, they found that climate change researchers tend to fly more than other scientists, which is a bit of a funny result. Um, unsurprisingly, it does correlate highly with uh, seniority in academia. Uh, there has been quite a few uh, studies into the impact of, of different conferences. So for example, they found that the one week conference at the American Geophysical Union emitted as much greenhouse gas emissions as the entire city of Edinburgh for that week in the UK. Um, or, for example, the example uh, at the bottom is the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience, and it's the same carbon footprint as a thousand medium-sized labs for an entire year. So it's, it's just a different ways to put into context. Uh, th there has been a lot of very interesting work from the uh, astronomy field, um, and they compared actually two uh, iterations of their conference, one that was in person and the other one that was online. Um, for the in-person meeting, they found that the week emitted as much greenhouse gases as the entire Max Planck Institute for a full year. Uh, with the virtual one, it's more like a single return trip between North England and South of France. Uh, but that's no big surprise, but it's just quite interesting to put these numbers into perspective a little bit. Uh, as, yeah, astronomers did really interesting work. They, they studied more broadly the whole impact of the field because obviously, you know, you can't completely replace a, a conference online by a, a conference in person with a conference online. Um, and they studied also, you know, the impact of, of putting a telescope somewhere. So it's this kind of interesting approach where they look at the entire impact uh, of the field. Um, a little bit more work is just a slightly more like a, a report and another article so it just shows that, uh, yeah, we do have a problem and most, uh, you know, it's something that's starting to pick up in academia that we need to be a bit more mindful of how we do science. Uh, most of the papers I, I've shown so far, they all focus on the travels and conferences because it's the easy, it's the easy target, it's the easy to measure one. Uh, they don't talk so much about how we are doing science on a daily basis. And I'll try to talk a bit more about that today. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, training more specifically. So if you think about training, uh, first, it's the obvious impact is the impact of running the training session itself. And we get back to traveling and flying versus doing virtual, obviously. But there's also uh, what are the computing resources used to demonstrate or to practice if everyone's practicing at the same time. And, and I, hopefully there will be many more points that will be brought up during the discussions after that. Uh, but there's also the carbon footprint of using what is taught. You know, if you're teaching about uh, genome assembly or something like that, what will be the impact of people using it? So we can split it between, I guess, wet lab experiments and computations. Today, um, I'll focus on computations. Uh, but at the end, I'll, I'll point at some resources if you also do wet lab and you, and you would like to look into that. So computations again sorry for like subdividing but i think it's just just important to know what we're talking about um, the point is not to question every single keystroke so on the one hand you have you know emails writing on words web surfing scrolling instagram watching netflix uh, having a zoom meeting um, all these have individually quite low carbon footprint but the the reason why the carbon the total impact is bigger is because you know you send hundreds of emails or thousands of emails that's why that's the mass makes it um, significant um, and on the other hand, you have everything related to intense computations. So either it runs for long hours or it uses a lot of resources. You know, you have like 10 GPUs running together or it has large memory requirements. Um, and that's, that's the latest point is the latest point is what I'm going to focus on today. It doesn't mean the other 
part is not important. It's just, it depends a lot on usage and there's some other work being done. Plus it's a lot harder to estimate. Uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna focus on this one and that's maybe more relevant to, uh, to many of you. Final thing before I dive into the, uh, into the science. Um, for the purpose of today, all of that is the same thing. So it doesn't really matter if you're doing uh, your computation on a laptop or on a big desktop computer, or if you have a whole uh, data center in your institutions. And same, even for like uh, high performance computing, it doesn't really matter if you're using terminal based system or if you're using virtual machines. Uh, for today, everything's the same. So hopefully it's, it's relevant to most of you. So why does it matter? There are lots of numbers out there and, and lots of estimates and it's quite hard to estimate as you can imagine. But one number I, I wouldn't say like, but I find quite striking is the total global carbon footprint of data centers. Uh, for context, this is about the same as the entire American commercial aviation. Uh, admittedly, the data centers, the impact of data centers, science is only a small part of it. So let's zoom in. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Exceed. It's, um, it's kind of a network of uh, high performance computing facilities across different American institutions. They just mutualize resources. It's not, it's not really important. What's interesting is they share usage statistics. And we could see that uh, in 2020, they used 24 million compute hours every day, uh, which I just find a bit mind blowing as a number. What's also interesting is it's across all the fields of science. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a topic for everyone. The next question could be, well, yeah, sure, but why should we care in biology? But hopefully I'm in, I'm in a room here where everyone is convinced already. Uh, I just picked, uh, it was like a, an article from a few years ago from Nature, but it was like the most uh, impactful papers. Uh, and, and surely you recognize your favorite tool maybe in that. Um, so yes, we do rely massively on algorithms and on compute hungry algorithms to, to do what we're doing. I, I, I used to think that it was kind of a, an accepted stance until now. Um, well, not everyone agrees. So we've had a bit of pushback. Um, Google has published a few um, articles saying that, no, really, there's really nothing to worry about. The, the carbon footprint of um, the carbon footprint of computation is, is really not an issue. Uh, unsurprisingly, um, Yann LeCun, who is the head of Facebook AI, also agrees. I really wonder uh, why, why they all agree on that. But yes, they, they, don't, they don't seem to think so, but hopefully all of us here can agree that we do have a problem. It's not to say that we shouldn't do science, of course not, uh, or that it, you know, it's a massive issue and, and we can't do anything about it, but just, yeah, there, there, is a bit of a, there is a bit of carbon footprint issue. I don't, I don't want to uh, dunk on the field of AI at all. There are lots of people who are doing a lot of great work in this, um, in this space. Uh, there's a, a point that's brought up in the last paper, the uh, stochastic parrots that incidentally also brought down the entire Google AI ethics team, uh, is that sustainability is often intertwined with accessibility and, essay, and ethics, um, especially when you think that the population who suffer the most from climate change are also the population that will benefit the least from the latest version of Apple Siri or Amazon Alexa. So maybe that's something we can keep in mind and, and transpose to computational biology as well. All right, so now we can dive in into where does the carbon footprint come from? And hopefully that can be useful so you can pick and choose what's relevant to you um, and, and that you can reuse in your training. But broadly, we can divide it into three categories. Um, there is first the life cycle footprint of the hardware. So by life cycle, we means extracting the raw material, manufacturing, using it, and then disposing of it. And when we talk about consumer devices, the laptop, the tablet, the iPhone, um, 70 to 80% of this life cycle footprint is only from production, which means it doesn't really matter for these devices if you optimize usage or if you only charge it every other day. Um, it's very much about not having to produce another one. So keeping your devices for longer, eventually having fewer, repairing them and reusing um, already used devices is the one most impactful thing you can do to reduce your impact there. Uh, in data centers, it's a bit different because hardware in data centers is optimized to, well, 
be used all the time. So it's only 10 to 20% that's uh, due to manufacturing. That's still, uh, it's still 20%. And it's, it would be probably something to tend to is to include sustainability when deciding when to replace hardware. Something a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, in terms of like large data needs. If we break down the energy bill of a data center, we find on an average one, we find that only half the energy provided to the facility is actually used to power the servers. 10% uh, is used for storage and the remaining 40% is overheads, mainly cooling the facilities. And 10% is not a big number, but 10% of a big number, it's quite a lot of electricity. So it's, there are lots of numbers going around, but one you can keep in mind is 10 kilograms of CO2 equivalent uh, per terabyte and per year. That's the carbon footprint of um, storing data. It's not an exact number, but, just, but more like an order of magnitude to keep in mind. That just remind you to, that maybe doing a little cleanup once in a while is not a terrible idea. Okay, and now we get to the, heart of the topic uh, and that's probably what you have in mind when you think about calculating the carbon footprint of computation is I'm running my algorithm for three hours on 10 CPUs what's the carbon footprint of that and that's where it gets can get a bit complicated uh, because you don't there are lots of things that could be included um, what a lot of hardware what hardware to use and that's every every single topic could be a very deep rabbit hole but fortunately, you can make it a lot simpler. So rapidly, the carbon footprint of running something, it's the energy you need. That only depends on your hardware and your software. And it's also, it depends on how the energy you need is produced. And that only depends on energy production met methods. So most of the time, it will be how the energy is produced in your country or your state. Um, unless you have your own solar panels, for example. But most of the time, that's, that's how it's decided. And that's it, that's very straightforward. Uh, if we focus on the first one, how to calculate the energy we need, uh, if it doesn't ring any bells here, feel free to ignore, it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, to give an idea. Uh, it depends on the time, on how long the model runs for, it depends on the hardware you need, uh, processors and memory, and it depends on the efficiency of the data center. So how much energy is needed for cooling typically. Uh, the running time is an interesting one because you can actually have a massive impact by just updating software. So I'll come back to these results in a bit. But for now, just look at the first two bars, the blue ones. It's the same GWAS run with Bolt LMM, the first version or the 2.3 version. And because they made the um, software a lot more efficient, it also reduced the carbon footprint massively. So by just upgrading it, you can uh, divide your carbon footprint by over three. Now, I, I know we all hate updating software as it breaks everything, um, but maybe once in a while, it's just worth looking at it because besides just saving you time, it can also uh, actually have a good uh, environmental impact. And if we look at just as the last bit, the part of, about the efficiency of the data center, I thought I would just mention the like, unwanted side effect that can happen sometimes. So um, a few years ago, the um, ECMWF, which is the Weather Forecast uh, Institute of uh, the European Weather Forecast Institute, announced that their data center that was so far located in Reading, UK, uh, would move to um, Bologna in Italy. And the main argument was, besides bringing a lot more modern hardware, was also that the PUE, which is like the efficiency coefficient of the data center, was a lot lower in Italy compared to Reading. So a great move and a great move from the environment until you look at how energy is actually produced in the two countries. And that's why it's not so great because uh, energy in the UK was greener than energy in Italy. And it turns out that when you do the balance of the two, it's a net loss for the environment with... Uh, an increase of 18% in greenhouse gas emissions because the improved the improved sorry efficiency of the data center couldn't uh, overcome the uh, worst carbon intensity. So it's just an interesting case that sometimes 
it's worth yeah digging a little bit deeper. And if you have any choice in the computing facility, which I know is, is not always the case for data access issues, for example, but if you have any choice in that, um, yes, you changing computing facility can be a good way to improve your carbon footprint or just promote an efficient data center where you are. All right, so we've sorted the first bit, how to estimate the energy we need. And now we just have to look at how we estimate the um, greenhouse gas emissions to produce said energy. And that's called carbon intensity and that varies greatly between countries. So if you look at that, you can see that it's, it's there are like orders of magnitudes of difference. For example, if you do exactly the same analysis in Switzerland compared to doing it in Australia, you will have a carbon footprint 74 times more, 74 times lower, which is just mind blowing. It's exactly the same analysis on exactly the same hardware, just because Australia is all powered by gas and coal, while like Switzerland is mainly powered by hydro and a bit of nuclear. Um, so yeah. That means if you have any control on that, oh, and here's uh, the US. But if you have any control on that, that's, you know, choosing location is a massive uh, improvement. Unless, obviously, your data center has its own power supply, for example, a solar farm or something like that. And then this is kind of irrelevant, but few do. If you want to check out how is the carbon intensity where you are? Do check out this website. It's called Electricity Map. It's really interesting. It's really good. They're updated live. Um, so the one example you have on the left is actually where all of you in person are. So that's the data they have for medicine. And you can see that it's not ideal. It's basically average. It's the world average, uh, give or take. Uh, but yeah, a lot of coal and a lot of gas. Uh, but yeah, you can click that and you can see live which countries are importing electricity and things like that. So uh, if you're interested, do check it out. And as I was saying, uh, choosing the computing facility carefully is definitely something we can do. Okay, so we're sorted. We know how to estimate carbon footprint. It's actually not that complicated uh, because we can ignore, we can make a lot of approximations and, and still get relatively relevant results. Um, and that's why it's important to do it because you can um estimate it and include it in cost benefit analysis and it's just the idea that is it worth running this computation now that we know the carbon cost of it so i said it's easy it's not quite that easy because we well it's still like a lot of values to find and although the formula is not that complicated it's still uh, finding a lot of data so that's why we created the green algorithm app so uh, feel free to check it out um it's it's just a, a quite simple online calculator um, you can just input any data you have about your model, how long it runs for, what kind of hardware, where you're located, what kind of facility you have. Um, you can leave the default value if you don't know what to put there, but otherwise, and then it outputs a carbon footprint and energy need and some kind of useful, hopefully, metrics. Uh, if you want to know in details how that works, we published a paper about it, so do check it out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, a great initiative. Um, with Jason Greeley uh, from the Bake Institute in Australia and Michael Inouye, who you will hear from just after that. And so we launched that, hope, hoping that it would help people. Uh, and that's how it's, it's been doing over the past two years. And that's, uh, that was quite a good surprise, actually. Quite a few lessons here. Um, we have something about 200 users every week now, which I wouldn't be expecting for something quite so niche. So I'm quite happy about that. And also, it's from all over the world. So it seems to confirm what we were suspecting without having any proof, which is scientists do care about their carbon footprint. Computational scientists do want to know what the impact of their work is. They, they were just lacking the tools to do it. So hopefully that can, that can help with that. Now, if we go back to uh, computational biology, we thought, oh, maybe it's worth having a bit more of a detailed survey of it. So that was uh, a study led again by Jason Greeley and, and a lot of collaborators um, about just surveying different fields of bioinformatics. And actually that picked up quite nicely. There was like an editorial about uh, focusing, especially on molecular phylogenetics. Uh, and these are 
the results. So I'm not going to dive into the details. Do feel free to uh, check the paper if you want to find your favorite tool. But this is the different tools we surveyed. Uh, sorry if we missed yours, but then that just means you need to, um, yeah, just plug the data in the calculator and share it uh, on Twitter or something so people have a better idea of your field as well. Okay, something I didn't mention is all these figures are for one run of the algorithm, but as we all know, it never works the first time. So that's something to take into account as well, is is it worth running this algorithm another 20 times just on the off chance that we're going to get something slightly different? Maybe not, or maybe yes, and, and then that's fine. But just keeping in mind that, you know, every time you rerun the model, you just emit the exact same greenhouse gases. And that has kind of a, a nice effect with uh, triggering a lot more studies in, in recent years, uh, in the past like year or so. Uh, we've seen a lot more studies about the topic, about green computing, not only in computational biology, but in any kind of computational based science, uh, or, or we have here uh, the NHS or virtual machines and things like that. So uh, it's been really good to see that it, it, it got picked up. Now, if, if there's only one message for you to take home today, I'd say that's this one. Um, as you know, especially based in institutions, I guess we're all a bit guilty of that, that computing is kind of free, I guess, any PI in the room who is footing the bill at the end of the month will disagree. But most of the time, computing cost is not the limiting factor. It's not like in a wet lab, the costs are a lot lower. And in most situations, yes, we a lot of us, and, and maybe, I mean, I've, def, I've definitely been guilty of that. We do consider computing to be a bit free. So the point of that is just to mention that there is a cost, maybe not financial, but there is a carbon cost. And not to say we shouldn't do science, again, that's really important. It's not to say we shouldn't, if, we should even slow down on science. It's just to say, if we're mindful of this carbon cost, maybe we will try to avoid wasting it. So what can we do about it? Uh, well, quite a lot, it turns out. You've seen all the little tips, green bubbles throughout this talk. So hopefully nothing here will come as a surprise, but it's just the same thing. You know, keep, prepare, reuse, efficient data centers, pick your location, acknowledge your carbon footprint, uh, it's included in cost benefit and things like that. Um, so we've put it all together uh, in a in kind of a, a easy to read piece. So with Jason again and Alex and Mike, uh, who you will hear from just after. And so yeah, if you want an easy version of it to to go through, uh, do feel free to check it out. Uh, it's a lot shorter than than an article. Are we there yet? Not quite, as you can imagine. Uh, and there are probably a lot more that we still need, but I've just picked on two different aspects. One is to reduce frictions further. Um, the, the online calculator, I think, was a good first step. It made it a lot easier for people to estimate their carbon footprint. It's not quite perfect yet, because as you said, if you run, for example, a lot of different models, you will need to put each of them in the calculator, which is not very practical. Uh, it's not really easy to reduce carbon footprint sometimes because you, you know, it's not necessarily a topic of conversation with the HPC facilities. Um, they are not necessarily like department policy on how to make up for your carbon footprint or how to use more efficient data centers. So we, we need to work on reducing this friction. So for scientists to want to be as sustainable as possible, it should be very easy. And then we need more transparency and from everyone. So we do need, we need to be more transparent as scientists about the impact of our own work instead of you know, pretending that because it's computational, that it doesn't cost anything. Uh, but cloud providers can do a lot better be, beyond marketing. Uh, hardware's manufacturers need to be more transparent about the energy needs of their products. Data centers and institutions uh, can definitely do a lot better about communicating about the, the parameters, the efficiency of the data center, where the energy is coming from, which is still, especially institutions, not something all institutions are very happy to communicate openly about. But hopefully we're moving in the right direction. Speaking of reducing uh, frictions further, I, something that was in the back of my mind for a while is that, okay, well, the calculator is good, but what I want is something a bit like that, which is uh, just, you know, on the terminal, if you're using terminal-based HPC, just saying, I want to know my carbon footprint. I put a start date, I put an end date, and it gives me the carbon footprint of everything I've done on the cluster during this day. Um, 
so I made something that basically does that. It's it's still a beta version in the sense that it's not like very polished and put together, but it does the job. Um, it's all on GitHub, so feel free to check it out. It's a lot less pretty than the app. I will give you that because it's in the terminal, but it's also a lot more accurate because it has access to all your logs and things like that. It also gives you statistics that, well, it gave me statistics that I wish I didn't know something about how many jobs of me failed or the carbon footprint of over allocating memory and things like that. So, but I guess it's good to know. Um, if you want to try it, uh, so it's, it's still beta version, but I'd be very happy to like see how it works on different systems and things like that. So it's all on GitHub, uh, but yeah, if you want to get involved, just shoot me an email and I'd be very happy to help you set it up. We've been trialing it in Cambridge and that's worked quite well so far. Uh, now, examples of transparencies. Um, well, this was is an old one now. It's like a couple of years old, but I still uh, quite like it. It was when they released the new Sage tool for uh, GWAS. As an, a side argument, they wanted to show the carbon footprint, but if you opened it on Twitter, that's what you got out of it. And I still think it's really funny that uh, Twitter thought it was uh, offensive uh, content. But if you say that it's safe, then you look at it, and it just shows that, you know, because it's much faster, much more efficient, it also saves a lot of carbon footprint. So in this case, it, it, it turned into a good argument of why people should be using this, this tool rather than others, which is great. If it can be sustainable and help your research, brilliant. Uh, something we've, tried, uh, we've been trying to do in the lab is like uh, any uh, publication that relied heavily on computation, we would like have a bit of an acknowledgement section at the bottom um, where we would just acknowledge the carbon footprint of it and, and and yeah, that's it. Just just transparency. The more information we people have about it, the more normal it will be to to acknowledge it. All right. Uh, I try. I talked a lot about uh, computing and and dry labs, but obviously sustainability in labs is a lot broader. Is a, is a much broader topic. If you're interested in that, I would recommend this um, podcast, The Caring Scientist, which uh, is it's a lot of interviews and a lot of uh, discussions and a lot of tips. That's really interesting. Uh, and there's also the LEAF initiative uh, driven by uh, University College London that's mostly do, um, directed at uh, wet labs, how to keep wet labs um, sustainable, but we're working with them to, to include also dry labs component into that. So hopefully uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, lots of useful tips. Uh, we actually, well, I'm a bit biased, but we, yeah, we did an episode about computing with a caring scientist, but most of the episodes are about um, sustainable labs in general. And uh, do check out for Green Labs initiatives in your home institutions. Uh, the Netherlands has been particularly good about it, but I know there are some like that all around the world. So there may be some, um, yeah, some, some movements um, already going on. So do, do check that out. Um, this is very much repeating what I've said before, but it's just a slide I usually, when I do workshops with uh, either students or trainees or, or PhD students about about that, that's usually what I end on because I think that's a good summary of what can a, a you know computer scientist or a computational researcher do now. Uh, but that's that just uh, loops back on what I said before. And I'll just finish by talking about offsetting because it's a well, it's a it's a complicated topic and it's a controversial topic. Uh, the thing is, offsetting can be seen as an easy way out. You know, instead of reducing carbon emission. You just um, you can just buy off your carbon emissions, and it's a way to feel good about it. Or in the case of large companies, to uh, do a bit of greenwashing. The problem is the what's important to know is that the assumption, for example, if you sponsor you know like ten trees and they say that you offset that much amount of carbon, is based on the assumption that your ten trees will stay where they are in the same environment for the next fifty years. And without, you know, having any diseases or anything. And if, if these 10 trees stay where they are in the same environment, yes, they will offset your carbon footprint. But I'm sure many of you can see uh, everything that can go wrong along the way. So it's really hard to know for sure that what you're doing, what you're investing in actually offsets your emissions. And it should especially not be taken as a get out of jail card provided you can pay for it. Because you know you've you've read uh, or you've seen the output of the IPCC report, we just can't afford to think like that. We need to reduce carbon emissions. We can't only you know offset them. That said, if once you've done everything you can to reduce and mitigate your impact, yes, it's probably better than nothing uh, to to try to offset it as much as possible. So, but it should really be taken as a last resort 
uh, resource. And um, there are a lot of like standards that can, uh, that assess the offsetting initiative. So that's that's a good place to start if you want to do that. Uh, carbon footprint is one. Um, but yeah, try to go through like reliable uh, organisms and, and very much as a last resort. All right, that's it. I think I'm, I'm just on time. So I'll just finish by thanking all our collaborators and everyone who's kind of like followed us on this slightly weird journey. Uh, if you have any questions about the Green Algorithm project or in general about what I talked about today, feel free to shoot me an email. And, I, and if you want to follow the app, I tend to uh, post updates when I update the app uh, on Twitter. And I'm very much looking forward to the panel now. Thank you. <laughs>